Welcome to World Mycotoxin Report Impact 2021, a webinar brought to you by Biomin and Romer Labs. My name is Joshua Davis and I am Communications Manager at Romer Labs. In addition to hosting this wonderful webinar year after year, I also have the privilege of producing the Romer Labs Mycotoxin Minute, our weekly look at interesting stats and facts about mycotoxins. It's good to be with you. I'd like to welcome today's three panelists to the webinar. First up, on our uh, first up on our panel is Alexandro Marchioro, Senior Mycotoxin Expert at Biomin. How are you doing, Alex? I'm fine. It's a pleasure to be here today. It's good to have you. Um, you know, Alex, at this point, I'd probably ask you about all the wonderful places you traveled over the last year, but with all the coronavirus restrictions, of course, you've probably been doing a lot of sitting at home like the rest of us. Now, that said, what are some of the main mycotoxin concerns that you've been hearing about? Yeah, it's true. We work at a lot of from from home, and uh, the Corona crisis uh, brought uh, as alternatives ways to keep in touch with the market. You know, like this right. one web. And however, problems related to mycotoxin contamination continue to appear during the past uh, year. And today we are going to present a lot of data on contamination profiles that we found. All right, great, great. Well, welcome back. It's good to see you. Um, I'd also like to welcome back Annalisa Müller, Product Manager for Mycotoxins at Biomin. Hi, Josh. My pleasure to be here. How's it going? I'm doing great. Thanks. And I'm also glad to be here. Um, is there anything in particular that stands out about this year's survey results? I mean, I have to admit, most of the surveys really interesting, but as last year, I'm a big fan of the emerging mycotoxins. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the emerging, my, emerging mycotoxins, those ones that you may not always test for that still could um, still could cause problems, right? Yes, exactly. I think it's a topic we should pay attention to. Oh, good. And uh, if I understand correctly, you'll be saying a little bit more about that later, right? Mm -hmm, exactly. We're looking forward to that. Good to be good. Good to have you here. Thanks. And I'd also like to welcome my colleague Nora Kogelnik, product manager for Mycotoxin Rapid Solutions, and Eliza at Romer Labs who is also joining us here for the first time. Hi, Josh. It's great to be here. Well, it's great to have you here, Nora. And if I'm not mistaken, you've been more than a little busy lately, haven't you? That's right. We've rolled out a new product, Agostrip Robotics Test Kits for the rapid detection of mycotoxin. I will be talking about, about it a bit later in the webinar. Well, that's great. I'm sure that we're all looking forward to hearing more about it. Um, and we'll, we'll, we'll certainly uh, talk about it a bit later. But before we jump into the webinar, uh, I just want to make a few announcements to our audience. I want to remind you that this is an interactive webinar. When you open the toolbar on the right-hand side of your screen, you'll find a menu for audio, visual, and other technical settings within the webinar platform. You can ask a question at any time throughout the session, so please feel free to enter questions for our speakers and for the Q&A session later on. If we can't get to your question over the course of the webinar, we may contact you by email afterwards with an answer. We want to hear from you, so please don't be shy. So without further ado, let's get into the survey. Alex, tell us, what can you say about the survey this time around? Well, as you know, uh, the Biomain Mycotoxin Survey is part of the, the technical service we offer to our customers. And we collect data from their feed uh, materials samples uh, to help them to understand which mycotoxins are found at which concentrations and the potential uh, treats to their uh, animals. So based on the data, we can uh, give tailored recommendations regarding the most suitable product and proper dosage uh, for complete and cost effective uh, mycotoxin risk measurement. So let's have a look at the numbers. So by mean, uh, I run this survey every year since 2004. 2004. In 2020, we tested uh, more than uh, 21,000 samples on finished feed and uh, raw materials. And we performed more than uh, 96,000 analyses. So this data came from 79 countries. This gives us a, a pretty good picture of the worldwide occurrence of mycotoxins. 
But uh, let's go through into this topic with more details and have a look at the worldwide, worldwide contamination. So let me explain how to read this map. For all regions, uh, we listed the prevalence for the main mycotoxins, analyzed in the boxes. You can see how many samples tested positive for aflatoxin, xeralinone, deoxynivalenol, uh, T2 toxin, fumonizins, and nocratoxin A. In this world map, the subregions of the world are colored according to the percentage of the samples above the risk thresholds. So worldwide, 65% uh, of the samples exceed these thresholds. Risk threshold may be a tricky concept for some of our listeners. Could you explain it to us? Yes, of course. So uh, the risk thresholds are uh, defined by, by biomin due to worldwide practical experience and in the field and scientific trials uh, and also according to the literature. So yellow means moderate risk and up to red representing uh, extreme risk with more than 75% of the tested samples above the risk threshold. So we can see that all regions are affected by mycotoxin. And then take into consideration global uh, trait of, of raw materials. So the occurrence and concentrations you observe pose a potential uh, threat to swine, poultry, ruminant, and agriculture product production. Well, thanks. That makes a lot of sense. Um, so tell me, according to your analysis, what are the main factors contributing to the patterns of worldwide mycotoxin occurrence that you see? Well, uh, as we know, uh, fungi uh, on crops in the, in the field or in the storage uh, levels uh, have produced mycotoxins a long time. So we know that the environmental stress has a significant impact on this. And uh, at the moment, uh, climate change is the main trigger influencing mycotoxin prevalence around the world. So extreme scenarios such as uh, desertification, uh, floods, and fluctuation between uh, wet and dry uh, periods affect the life cycles of fungi. So weather conditions at a strain at certain growing stages, uh, particularly flowering and harvesting, definitely influence uh, the mycotoxin occurrence. And to illustrate uh, this impact, uh, I have brought some examples here. So soybean planted in Brazil was underway uh, due to little rainfalls uh, and something uh, similar happened in Argentina. And you can remember that this region was affected by the phenomenon uh, called uh, La Nina last year. So in the US also the corn and soybean crops were affected due to damaging weather conditions during August in parts of the Midwest region. And also uh, in central, uh, central China, uh, the vast uh, uh, floods in June and July caused also a huge impact on agriculture, damaging huge crops areas, including rice, uh, vegetable and vegetables and, and, and fruit. And the strong floods also uh, occurred in Bangladesh uh, with a lot of damage. So e as, as you can see, these extreme uh, weather events are increasingly present and uh, impacting our lives and the production of the raw materials uh, for food and feed production. So in the world maps that you just showed us, there are many different mycotoxins in the mix. Do these occur in similar patterns everywhere or is there a geographic variation? Yeah, good point, Josh. Um, I think to answer this question, um, let's go through the data. And we have a separate map for each region that show the, the sub-regional risk. And let's start with the US and Canada. So as you can see here, the risk is extreme. And the gray bars indicate the prevalence of the main mycotoxins detected on all analysis performance. And we can uh, compare with the, pre the prevalence of that uh, same uh, mycotoxins uh, presented in the previous year. So the pictures of the animals are colored according to the proportion of samples uh, above the risk threshold for each animal species. So meaning animal colors indicate the risk posed to these species by the prevalence and concentration 
of each mycotoxin in our uh, samples from this region. So clearly, DOM is the one of the main concern in all species. As highlights from this region in core, we observe uh, a high DOM prevalence where 72% uh, where of the samples were contaminated with this mycotoxin, followed by FUM with 70% and ZEN with 40%. And also DGGS, core DGGS, uh, calls uh, our attention as it's, it, it is uh, highly contaminated with uh, fusarium mycotoxins. And we will show more details about it in, in the next slides, right? So here, um, let me guide uh, you through uh, in, this, in this slide. In the figure to the right, we see the co-contamination. So how many mycotoxins uh, are present in a sample? Non-mycotoxin, one mycotoxin, or more than one. So in, in corn, we detected a high co-contamination where 60% of the samples were contaminated with more than one mycotoxin. Here in the left corner, you can see the prevalence of the main mycotoxins. And on the top, in the table, we can see the number of samples investigated average and maximum values. So the average of contamination were quite high for DOM with more than 750 ppbs, FUM with the more than 2,400, 2, and ZEN 300 PPD, ppbs. So let's go to the south. And starting with Brazil, one of the most important countries in the region, producing and exporting raw material for animal production. So we detect a high foam prevalence, 83% uh, of corn samples were contaminated with this mycotoxin, followed by Dawn with 48%. Uh, uh, foam uh, presented an average close to 2,300 ppb, with a maximum concentration of uh, 50, 56,000 ppb. So what is interesting in, in the maximum is the maximum values found uh, for them that was uh, 4,250 ppb. This high contamination can cause several clinical problems for the animals in the field, especially in the reproductive tract. So here we have the soybean data from Brazil. This important raw material was particularly uh, affected by Don, Zen, and T2 toxin. What does, was a surprise in the max is the maximum uh, found for them around 43,800 ppb. In Argentina, the situation was quite similar to Brazil. So corn was high uh, contaminated with uh, 2,721 ppb of foam on average, followed by down with uh, 600, 631 ppb. But however, the maximum found was high with uh, more than 6,000 ppb. All right, so now let's have a quick look at the highlights of mycotoxin occurrence in Asia. And for this, I'd like to bring Anavisa into the conversation. My pleasure. Thank you. I want to start with the overview of Asia. And we see again this year that the risk remains extreme, mainly in South Asia, as well as in China and Taiwan. The risk is still severe in Southeast Asia and East Asia, and the situation is different and risk is moderate in Australia and in New Zealand. We see very high levels of the Fusarium mycotoxins again. Fumonisins are most prevalent, followed by deoxyvalenol and serolenol. Interestingly, in this region, ochrotoxin A and T2 increased in the prevalence compared to last year. Aflatoxin is still a risk for all of the livestock, a maximum of 2,495 ppb was found, and also serotonone occurs frequently in 68% of the corn samples, and it reaches a maximum of 11,780 ppb. Okay, now I want to move on to the European data. We can see that the risk in Europe is still high to severe. The most prevalent mycotoxin found is deoxynivalenol, followed by serotonone. 
And the risk in Europe is really mainly due to the occurrence of dioxin nivolinol, particularly in corn. I want to show you some highlights for the overall region. Besides the high prevalence of DON in corn, we see a slight increase in the average contamination with serolinone, reaching over 170 ppb. Also in cereals, we could detect the oxynivalinol at concentrations as high as 11,870 ppb. And do we see a uniform pattern of contamination within Europe, or are some regions affected differently from others? Yes, good point. The regions are differently affected. This is mainly due to the differences in climate, but also the grains produced. And in Central Europe, um, I want to focus on this region first. Really, deoxynivalinol is the main problem. Let me show you some examples of important grain producing countries. In France, in wheat grains, we see they are moderately affected with deoxynivalinol and serolinol, but still, deoxynivalinol occurs in more than every second sample and a maximum of over 5,900 ppb was found. The co-contamination in wheat grains in France is moderate. But the picture changes a lot when we have a look at corn kernels in France. Here the prevalence of the fusarium mycotoxins, fumonisins, deoxynivalinol and serolinol is very high. We see elevated levels of deoxynivalinol, over 1,000 ppb. And the average serolinone concentration is higher than 300 ppb. This is a level that can already cause harm in animals. Moving to Germany, here we also see that corn is higher contaminated than wheat and barley. The oxynivalinol is found in 90% of all of the samples, with an average of 960 ppb and a maximum of 5,406 ppb. Also, serolinone is found in 40% of the samples. I would like to show you also the data for Hungarian wheat grains. Here we can see that the oxynivalinone is still the main threat, with an average of 1,560 ppb. But here we can see that also other mycotoxins, they are highly prevalent, aflatoxins, T2, and also ochratoxin. In Romanian barley, we see that um, all the samples that have been analyzed for deoxynivalinol, from those samples, 92% were positive, and they really show a super high average of 1,800 ppb. What about the big grain producing countries in Eastern Europe? Yes, um, let's move on to the Ukraine. Here I want to show first the contamination in wheat grains. The sample number just gives a first impression of the contamination, but we say we see, excuse me, that the oxynivalinol is most prevalent in 68% of the samples, and it shows an average concentration of 803 ppb. The highest concentration found even exceeded 6,400 6, ppb. In the Ukraine also, Corn samples have been more affected. The oxynivalinol, fumonisins, and serolinol are most prevalent. The average contamination of the oxynivalinol is very high with 1,014 ppb. And in Eastern Europe, of course, I want to also present Russian data to you. In Russian corn kernels, the most frequently found mycotoxins are fumonisins in 61% of the samples followed by T2, deoxynivalinol, and serolinol. The average concentration of humonicin is 1,018 ppb, with a maximum of almost 14,000 ppb found. Also, T2 shows an average of 82 ppb. T2 belongs to the A trichotocenes, and they appear normally at lower concentrations than the B trichotocenes, but at those lower concentrations, they show already more severe effects. Any highlights for Southern and Northern Europe? Yes, just very briefly. I want to present corn data for Southern Europe. Here the corn is strongly affected with fumonisins found in 95% of the samples, and a maximum of almost 12,800 ppb was found. Also in this region, it's interesting that the aflatoxins, they do play a role with an average of 17 ppb. 
And as a last highlight, I want to show um, data from Italy for corn silage samples. Please have a look at the average concentration of fumonescence. It's 4,210 ppb. And fumonescence were also prevalent in all of the samples. So in Europe and in Central Europe in particular, corn is the most affected commodity. The main challenge for livestock seems to be deoxynevalanol. And wheat and barley were also highly contaminated in some countries. Is there anything else to add? Well, I would add that we see P2 more frequently in Eastern Europe, mm -hmm. that in Southern Europe, fumonescence and also aflatoxins should be considered. And um, for Northern Europe, that the most prevalent mycotoxin found is deoxynivalenol followed by serotonin. All right, um, so let's move the focus a little bit. Uh, what is the situation in Africa and the Middle East? We have quite some samples from this region. Let me show you first some results from Middle East. Here we can see that the oxynivalenol is the main threat for the animal species and the fusarium toxins are most prevalent in this region. Now looking at all of the samples in Middle East, we can see that 80% of all of the samples were contaminated with more than one mycotoxin. So the co-contamination is high. And although the average concentrations are rather moderate, the maximum found for fumonescence, deoxynivalenol, and also serolinone are high. Let's move on to Africa. The main risk in sub-Saharan Africa is due to deoxynivalenol followed by fumonescence. Also, the risk increased slightly in this region. We see in cereals that 92% of the samples were contaminated with deoxynivalenol with a maximum of 917 ppb. In South Africa, the corn was mainly subjected to fusarium mycotoxins. Here, deoxynivalenol was the most prevalent mycotoxin in 95% of the samples, followed by serolinone in 54% of the samples. Also, the co-contamination with 76% is quite high. And in South Africa, what is very interesting, we tested some straw samples last year, and it was quite a surprise um, how high the scent contamination in these samples were. An average of 1,664 ppb were found, with a maximum value of 2,900 ppb. Alex and Annalisa, thank you for your insights into the different regions. Uh, the amount and specificity of the data are pretty impressive as always, so thank you very much. Now I'd like to shift gears and ask you all to think a bit about mycotoxin detection in particular detection of the so-called usual suspects, the big four that are most commonly regulated. Of course, I'm talking about aflatoxin, deoxynivalenol, famonazin, and zeralinone. And for this, I'd like to bring in Nora Kogelnik, one of our mycotoxin experts at Romer Labs. Hi, Josh. Hi again. So Romer Labs has a new rapid detection system to detect exactly these mycotoxins, right? That's right, we're calling it AgoScript Robotic System, and here's what it looks like. We flatter our flow devices for the four big mycotoxins you just mentioned, and the AgroVision Pro Reader Incubator. So tell us, what will you be discussing in the few minutes you have here? I will be talking about what the AgroScript Robotic System is, how it works with the AgroVision Pro Reader, and the test protocol in a nutshell. But first, a question. What is that mycotoxin testers need and expect from a rapid test system? To answer this, I would like to invite you to consider a typical testing situation. I'm sure that many of you will recognize this. Incoming raw materials, either at grain storage facilities, feed producers, you name it. Incoming raw materials are tested for mycotoxins. A decision immediately has to be made whether to accept or reject the grain according to internal acceptance thresholds. If it's accepted, the results may have a bearing on where stored. 
You can easily imagine how this could be a stressful situation while one shipment is being tested, another truck is waiting or driving up onto the scale. Time is of the sense, so testers need results fast. There could be more trucks just waiting for approval to unload. To make matters more difficult, space is often limited. There's often no lab, just small testing locations at facility entrance gates. And conditions are dusty, you might expect when dawns of rain are being loaded and unloaded. Furthermore, you can't expect operators, operators to have ex extensive experience with diagnostic tools. In our experience, and this is what we're hearing from our customers, operators have little training in these techniques. Last but not least, it is often an overlooked fact that the ambition temperature can vary by a lot. This can have an impact on the efficacy of the technical equipment you are using. It doesn't sound easy trying to detect mycotoxins under these circumstances. That's why we have developed AgoStrip ProVortex. It is first and foremost rapid. Testers like those at our brain receptions are here can up the brain intake with a quick sample preparation, a four minute essay time and the capacity to test four samples at once on site. I will say it again because we are proud of it. A four minute essay time. Agostrip Provortex is simple. Eliminate errors with a common extraction, dilution, and an intuitive walk-away operation. No sophisticated training process is required. The water-based extraction also means no handling or disposal of organic solvents. It is robust, which means it's built with the depth of conditions like those I just discussed in mind. So just because it might be a bit dusty doesn't mean that you have to sacrifice precision. Yep, it couldn't have said it better by myself. And just to round out the first intro to the system, AgoStrip Provortex features a streamlined testing procedure and the connectivity that testers have come to expect. Our test strips are blockchain enabled and you can transfer your data to a PC or print it out with ease. The AgoStrip Provortex is a complete system consisting of bladder flow devices for the detection of total aflatoxin, deoxynivolenol, total fumonisin, teralenone, and the AgroVision Pro Reader. The AgroStrip Provortex mycotoxin test strips are designed to cover a broad detection range in combination with high sensitivity in order to receive accurate results even at low mycotoxin concentrations. Here are some of the highlights and don't worry if I go through the next slide a bit too fast. You can look all this up on romalabs.com at your leisure. Our alpha toxin strip offers a quantitation range from zero up to 460 ppp. It also features a high sensitive method with a limit of detection of one ppp, the lowest available by LFD on the market. Our DON strip has a quantitation range from zero up to 44 ppm, with a limit of detection of 0.1 ppm and a limit of quantification of 0.2 ppm. The test strip offers a broad detection range without compromising on sensitivity. Other strip pro total fumonisin vortex offers the same broad quantitation range from zero up to 44 ppm, with the high sensitivity of a limit of detection of 0.1 ppm. And here's our sun strip. It has a wide concentration range from zero up to 1,650 ppp with a limit of detection of 25 ppp and a limit of quantification of 40 ppp. That sounds great, but I'm really interested in hearing more about that reader. <laughs> the AgroVision Pro reader is much more than just a reader. It's got a built-in incubator and has a seven inch display and very important, all four slots operate independently, which makes that it's that much easier to use. So how does all this work together? <laughs> First, don't laugh, turn on the AgroVision Pro and choose mycotoxins. Then you have your extraction, weigh in your sample and add the extraction buffer, bag and water. Shake, shake, shake. Dilute and centrifuge. 
One thing and point out here, all four mycotoxins share common 1 to 11 dilution. Which means that you can test for all four mycotoxins from the same extraction, right? That's right. And here comes the fun part. Put the strip in the cartridge and put the cartridge into the reader. The AgroVision Pro will prompt you for some information about the sample. And then you prepare the extract into the cartridge. And then what? <laughs> then you can do whatever you want to. Prepare another sample, read a book, watch a cut video. The AgroVision Pro reader takes care of the rest. Incubation and timing are all automated. Results are displayed automatically when the test is done. Of course, you can get more detailed information for each sample. Just tap the information icon on, the, on your set. So let's sum up. The AgroStrip Pro Vortex is rapid. Test four mycotoxin at once in just four minutes. With a common extraction and dilution and an intuitive fog away operation, it's easy and really to use. It's robust, giving precise, reliable results, even in the toughest of conditions. It is connected with blockchain-enabled strips and easily printable and exportable results. And last but not least, our experts are here to help whenever and wherever you need them. So where can people find out more about AgriStrip Pro Watex? Just visit romalabs.com slash en slash agostrip dash pro. All you need and more is there. All right. Well, thank you, Nora, and congrats to you and the whole team for rolling out such an impressive test system. Now, as we know, there are more than just four mycotoxins out there. What about all those other mycotoxins, Annalisa? Yes, exactly. In addition to the main mycotoxins that are well studied and subject to regulation, there are also other mycotoxins researchers are warning of, the so-called emerging mycotoxins. In Biomin, we offer the multi-mycotoxin analysis method Spectrum Top 50, which detects over 50 mycotoxins, including the emerging mycotoxins, in just one run. So maybe for listeners not so familiar with these terms, what do you mean by emerging and masked mycotoxins? Can you help us out with the terminology? Sure, it's a good question. Um, the emerging mycotoxins are frequently found on agricultural commodities. There are also there is scientific literature supporting that they have toxic effects and investigations. And also the European Food Safety Authority is showing increasingly interest and is publishing reports um, with risk assessment for these toxins. I also want to point out the masked mycotoxins very briefly. Here you can see a fungus, a mice plant. Uh, a mice plant infected by a fungus and producing a mycotoxin, the oxynivalinol. What can happen in the plant is that as a defense mechanism, the plants um, attach a glucose molecule. Now the molecule is called the oxynivalinol 3 glucoside. This is a masked mycotoxin. We call it like this because it cannot be detected anymore with conventional methods. What happens in the animal then is that in the gastrointestinal tract, the glucose is cleaved and the original deoxynivalinol is present and can harm the animal. Also, the EFSA, the European Food Safety Authority, highlighted the importance of considering the occurrence of those masked mycotoxins. Now I want to show you an overview of our results with the Spectrum Top 50 methods. 2,878 samples have been analyzed, and the mycotoxins are listed in the left according to their abundance. Most prevalent was deoxynivalinol, and in red, we see the masked mycotoxin, the oxynivalinol 3 glucoside, it was present in 42% of the samples, and in blue, the emerging mycotoxins. And here, boveracin, alternariol, and amiatines have been very frequently found. And just to give you an idea of what we know about those emerging mycotoxins now, for modenilformin, it has been reported that broilers are very susceptible. Um, it is genotoxic and can have negative effects, particularly on the heart, but also muscular weakness, respiratory distress, and immunosuppression have been described. Bovaricine and amiatines showed negative effects on the immune system, and accumulation in fat-rich tissue was shown, although to a very low degree. Alternariol showed no acute toxicity, 
but still um, the chronic effects needs to be investigated. And in lab experiments in vitro, we see cytotoxicity, mutagenicity, as well as effects on reproductive and immune system. So let me ask, um, what about the prevalence of these emerging mycotoxins? Yes, I want to show you their global occurrence based on our data from 2020. We see they are globally present and they are highly frequent. I show you in blue the two emerging mycotoxins most often found in a different region in different commodities. And again in red, the mask mycotoxin, the oxynivalinol 3 glucoside. And another mycotoxin I have not mentioned yet, nivalinol in orange. What we can see is that the emerging mycotoxins are frequently found in the different commodities and globally. And looking at the occurrence of the masked form, we see it was found in 80% of all corn samples in South Africa. So this was pretty interesting for me. And also in 42% of wheat samples in Europe and 42% of finished wheat samples in Asia. The data is also interesting for nivalinol. It was frequently found in South America and Europe. And this is important because nivalinol is also a trichotisine and it can significantly add up to the trichotisine contamination. It can cause maybe even more toxic effects than the oxynivalinol, and it can also show synergistic effects with the oxynivalinol. Well, many thanks to you, Anneliese, for these insights into multi-mycotoxin analysis. My pleasure. Let me also steer our conversation back to another relevant issue. And for this, I'd like to bring Alex back into the conversation. Now, Alex, once you have test results in hand and you've identified a contamination issue, you're probably going to want to mitigate the risk to your animals. How can biamine help with that? What can biamine provide to the market? Great. Yeah. As we know, the mycotoxins have different structures, and that's uh, why different strategies are needed. Uh, for their counteraction. So with this in mind, Biomin offers to the market the well-known Mycofix product line that works with three different strategies. So adsorption, biotransformation, and bioprotection. So adsorption uh, via bentonite, it's a proven solution. It's gone through the full process of EU authorization for binding aflatoxins mainly. Then we have the biotransformation components, contains funzine for the degradation of fumonazines, the BSH for the big breakdown of uh, tricotacent, and the MTV components, counteracting the xeravenone and ocratoxin. On top of this, Microfix contains uh, the bioprotection components uh, to support and protect the liver and the immune system of the animals against the effects of uh, mycotoxins. So the Mycofix uh, product uh, line, it's uh, the most advanced tool uh, for mycotoxin control. So to reach this level, Biomin uh, cooperate with leading universities and research centers uh, from all around the world. And there are several peer-reviewed peer papers um, published to prove the efficacy of these products, not only in vitro, but in vivo as well. But for more information about the, the products, please uh, contact the Biomin representative. Well, thank you very much, Alex. Um, I'd also like to point out your website, which contains lots of technical information, survey data, as well as product information. You should see it on your screen now. And now I'd like to open up the Q&A session. Thank you to all the participants out there for all the questions that you asked. I'd also like to ask all of our panelists to join us on screen now. Well, the first question up seems to be uh, relating to a biomin topic, relating to the survey. Um, it says, sometimes we find some mycotoxins at moderate levels. Can these moderate levels also impact the animals? Who'd like to take that? Uh, I can take this one, Josh. Uh, Go ahead, thanks Alex. for the question. Yeah, definitely, yes. I mean, um, there are several peer review papers showing that not only the re uh, really high uh, mycotoxin uh, contamination can cause impact, but al uh, also this moderate uh, dosage or contaminations. So, especially in uh, on the gut and immune system. So. And definitely more and more information appear for, uh, about this. 
and we can uh, uh, be sure that the animals will be impacted when they are present, especially at the, the combination that we, sh we show it today, uh, and more than one mycotoxin present, so definitely will impact the animals this. All right, thank you. Um, this next question, um, I believe, is going to be for you, Nora, because it's talking about the, uh, the reader that belongs to the um, AgriStrip uh, ProWatech system. And just says simply, how do the four slots work together on the reader? I know you said something about independent uh, independent testing. Uh, could you elaborate on that? Well, they don't work together. We've designed the AgroVision Pro Reader to be able to carry out four separate tests completely independently. Each slot operates like its own miniature lab and delivers results whenever and ready, regardless of what's going on in with the other slots. All right, that's a clear answer. Thank you. Um, we have um, time for one final question here, um, and this is a this is a topic that we've touched on on in, in previous webinars. What are examples for synergistic effects of mycotoxins? Right, who would yeah. like to take that? I want Lisa? <laughs> yeah, thank you. Go ahead. Um, we mentioned before already that nivalenol can show synergistic effects with deoxynivalenol. And one common example, because they so often co-occur, is deoxynivalenol and serolinol, which can show synergistic effects. And one uh, very interesting publication, it showed that those the co-occurrence led to a very high impact on the intestine of piglets. So this is one example of synergistic effects. All right, thank you. I imagine there's more information about synergistic effects on the Biomin website. Yes, I tried to be quick. <laughs> I appreciate that. Well, thank you. And with that, we are now coming to the end of our webinar. As promised, you will be getting a few goodies from us. You'll receive an email including links to today's recording, the brand new Biomin Mycotoxin Survey Annual Report, the latest issue of Spot On from Romer Labs, and a link to a short on-site mycotoxin testing video within the next 24 hours. You'll also be prompted to take a short survey on today's webinar. It should take about two minutes to complete. By providing your feedback, you allow us to improve our webinar program and to identify future topics for discussion. We would appreciate your taking the time to complete the survey. So now it remains to me to thank our speakers, Alexandra Marchioro. Thank you very much, Josh, and thank you all for joining us today. Thank you, and thank you very much also to Anneliese Müller from Biomin. Yes, thanks to all of you, my pleasure. And also many thanks to Nora Kogelnik from Romer Labs. Well, thank you very much. This is Joshua Davis from Romer Labs saying visit us at biomin.net or romerlabs.com to learn more about how we can help you develop a mycotoxin detection and management strategy tailored to your needs. Thanks for your attention and have a great day.